welcome back to Dragon Ball Dissection, the in-depth analysis and review series of the Dragon Ball storyline. When last we visited, the adult characters made their way through the preliminaries of the 25th Tenkaichi Budokai. Despite their scores on the punch machine being dismissed as obvious malfunctions and Vegeta never even receiving a score due to breaking it, I guess none of that matters. They're all in. And even before they find that out, Goku and the others aren't waiting around for a second punch machine to arrive. So they abandon Gohan and Videl to watch the Junior Division. Just as the punch machine serves as a means to quickly navigate the preliminaries, this branch of the tournament is likewise streamlined. There are no preliminary matches at all. Every competitor gets to appear on the main stage. So you might think that means the readers would see more. But that's not the case. The matches are largely glossed over. This youth tournament is an exhibition for Goten and Trunks, and what little we see of the other children demonstrates a profound lack of interesting fighting prowess. Narratively, this further justifies the punch machine, as the kid fights serve the same function the preliminaries have served in previous tournament storylines. A series of lighter, skimmed-over fights to set the stage for the main event. We never got details for most of those fights because the focus was on the characters we care about. Splitting the tournament into two separate rosters could have resulted in a lot of redundancy, but due to the way this is structured and due to the lack of focus in irrelevant areas, it has the opposite effect. Redundancy is actually reduced because we're not seeing the same characters make their way through the brackets twice. Instead, this preliminary substitute provides a wholly different experience by focusing on silly children. That said, I do think a little more could have been done with it. We get exactly one panel of a match that does not involve Goten or Trunks, and it's of a fight ending with one kid winning because the other was reduced to tears. That's obviously the crux of the joke Toriyama's trying to tell. It's why characters like Kuririn complain that this won't be interesting in terms of actual martial arts until Goten and Trunks go at it. But we hear more whining about it sucking than actually seeing it suck. I fully admit in this case that I saw the animated version first, which I think handles it better, and that might be influencing me. It doesn't get bogged down in the boring details, but it throws in just enough different child gags to sell the idea that this is barely controlled chaos. Now that Trunks is taking center stage, it's a good time to begin discussing him. It's not that he's languished in the background up to this point, but the tournament is where we truly see how he differentiates himself from his Cell Arc counterpart. Trunks is a unique creation in Dragon Ball's text because he is, in essence, two completely separate characters. Sure, we get glimpses of the alternate timelines Gohan, Bluma, and number 17 and number 18. However, in terms of major characters, the two Trunkses serve as the only such example. The time travel shenanigans of the last story meant that we were introduced to Trunks completely out of order. He's not even the Trunks who belongs in our world. While he's biologically the same child of Bluma and Vegeta, he's a different person. But we knew him first. He was in the story for two years. He is the original Trunks as far as we're concerned and as far as the narrative is concerned. Then that story ended, and that character left. But in the Boo arc, we have this Trunks, who is, for all practical intents and purposes, a new character. Well, he was present throughout the last arc, but as a baby. As such, he barely did anything and certainly didn't have a personality. So we're really being introduced to him here. As I've said, one of the main things that appeals to me about Dragon Ball is the sense of growth and change. From the moment the cast returns for the 22nd Budokai, Dragon Ball demonstrates that this is going to be a series where time exists. Characters age, and there's never really a status quo. The Majin Buu arc in particular, while not exactly living up to such ideals, positions itself as a next generation story and opens up to the largest time gap the series has ever used to this point. What funnier way is there to turn that long-established idea on its head than to show time moving forward by, in essence, de-aging trunks? It's simultaneously perfectly natural for this baby to grow up into this boy, but wonderfully ludicrous that this young man should be replaced by this boy. It's the kind of logical development you can only expect from fantasy. However, that's just a gimmick. It's nice to look at and go, hey, isn't that funny? What makes it sustainable and really sells it, though, is using Trunks to demonstrate just how big an impact environment and upbringing have on a person. Because when I say that the two Trunkses are two different people, I don't simply mean that they both physically and separately exist. 
Their disparate experiences have produced two people who respond and prioritize differently. They have different outlooks, different dispositions. This Trunks didn't grow up in a hellish future fending off killer cyborgs. He grew up in a palatial estate with both parents, experiencing peace and prosperity with wealth and privilege at his fingertips. This Trunks is far more arrogant, pampered, and entitled. He's also eight, and I hope we were all at least a little more mature in our early adulthood than in our childhood. So obviously it's not a one-to-one -one comparison to future Trunks, but this outspoken schemer is still a dynamic contrast to the shy and exceptionally polite young man we're used to. It's an organic move, but it's risky too. Future Trunks was, and continues to be, a very popular character. When Shonen Jump released a character popularity poll near the end of the Cell arc, Trunks placed third, right behind Gohan and Goku. He ranked higher than Vegeta! And I've watched enough television to know that people don't tend to like when their favorite character is written off and replaced with a substitute. They also hate late-arrival, wise-cracking kid characters. Yet Toriyama was combining those two hated elements. In a way, he didn't really have a choice. The baby Trunks wasn't going to disappear. He had to continue existing, and therefore he had to continue in the story. And there really wasn't any narrative reason for the older Trunks to stick around. But the younger's existence served as a glowing opportunity, and it's one I'm glad Toriyama seized on. Kurudin's daughter, for example, is basically a background character. Her name won't even be mentioned in the story for another couple of years. Trunks could have continued as a character like that, but it's far better that he didn't. I was seeing Mirai Trunks versus Chibi Trunks debates on the internet long before either character made it to the States, and I know they rage on to this day. There are a lot of people who simply cannot stand this loud, spoiled, attitudinal 90s kid usurping his driven and tortured predecessor. I like both, and I'm a huge fan of the contrast. Considering he managed to hold on to that number three spot two years later while Gohan dropped out of the top five entirely, it's safe to say this Trunks has fans too. At the same time though, there is still a definite core to the duo of Trunks as it transcends timelines. Just look at Trunks' first match against Idasa, and tell me it doesn't remind you of his counterpart's fight against Frieza. A calm demeanor laced with trash talk until the moment the strike arrives, at which point he finishes things swiftly and decisively. It's still Trunks, but like we've never seen him before. I think it's a fantastic addition to this story, and I'm impressed how well Toriyama nails down which characteristics should be changed and which should be retained. All this to say, I like this fight. You know, for what it is. Idasa is simply the latest in the string of tournament bullies who get their comeuppance. That's not exactly new ground. It's funny to me that at 15 he's barely younger than Gohan and Videl, but he's so much smaller and scrawnier. Well, you know how wearing baggy clothes can give the illusion you're smaller? Maybe that huge mullet has the same effect. He's so lame, his name is even a play on the word Dasai, which means lame. He's not even the last example of his character type in this tournament. He's not even the last example of his character type in this division, as Goten's first match, by amazing coincidence, is against Ikose, Idasa's younger brother. His name, likewise, rearranges and extends Sekoi, which means petty or small-minded. You'd think a parent that would name her children such things must really hate them, but no. Their mother is wild about her boys and just as obnoxious as them. And by an even bigger coincidence, she happens to be sitting right next to Bluma and Chi-Chi so we can get some classic mommy fights. Bluma serves as the mouth, and Chi-Chi is the muscle. And while Oolong's relegated to the background, I do like his subtle facial expressions. Ikose's not any different than his slightly older brother. While he's not given as much setup, he exists for the same purpose. But just as Idasa proves that Trunks really is Trunks, Ikose demonstrates the differences between Trunks and Goten. Trunks has attitude, he's not afraid to show it, and he's not going to take any crap. Goten is polite and humble, even in the face of insults. He's genuinely confused by Ikose's lack of ability to harm him, and only reluctantly decides to end things. Naturally, after a short montage, Trunks and Goten meet each other in the finals. It's natural they'd best all comers until meeting up with each other. It's a narrative contrivance we readily accept that they happen to meet in the final match rather than any earlier point. They're the two best, so it's only proper they meet in the finals. This is the moment Goku and the others have been waiting for. Finally, they get to watch something entertaining. Gohan and Videl arrive just in time to see it. Between Goten's Kamehameha, 
the rules and games they impose on each other and then break, and the fair amount of actual strategy, this is a fight I've always really enjoyed. It's the first time I can think of in a while where a fight was just... fun. It's not too long, it's not ridiculously padded, it's not even training. It's two friends having fun while their parents, or, well, Vegeta lives vicariously through the competition. Unless I'm mistaken, this is the first fight like this we've seen since Goku's and Ten Shinhan's rematch. But it reminds me quite a bit more of Goku vs. Kuririn, and it contains just as much charm. But while they bumble around having fun, it's setting off strong reactions from everyone else. Come to think of it, it is rather weird that Gohan placed a moratorium on Super Saiyan, but has no issue with things like key blasts and flying, which were also seen in the Cell games, and frequently derided by Mr. Satanist tricks. I don't know. Maybe like with Ma Jr. over here, Gohan expected the audience to be a little savvier than they are and would be used to such things. Since they really should be. Even when training Videl, he doesn't seem to think those are that big of a deal. But apparently, they're a really big deal. So much so that cutting away to spectators aghast at flying does wear a bit thin after a while. But as the announcer revels in the tournament as it should be, and the TV crew's lament being unable to film, Mr. Satan is panicking especially after Goten messes up and transforms in order to get himself out of a pinch. This is what he has feared. More guys like those Cell Games characters have come to the tournament and he has to fight a match against the winner. And that winner is ultimately Trunks. After pulling a Frieza and claiming he can beat Goten using only one hand, Goten takes to the skies. Trunks expects him to dive bomb and gets out of the way, but Goten uses a Key Blast to propel himself. Trunks panics, transforms, and uses his forbidden hand to shoot a key blast of his own, barely knocking Goten into the spectator seats. Goten is adorably annoyed that Trunks cheated to win, but he's mollified when Trunks offers him toys, which is a great cap to this fight. The cherry on top is witnessing Mr. Satan do his best to deal with this reality. He knows losing to a kid will sink his reputation, and he is smart enough to realize there's no way he measures up to Trunks. In particular, I love the panel where the outward appearance shows his usual bluster, but inside he knows he's screwed. He does everything he can to stall for time. He grandstands, he works out, he pretends an old knee injury flares up, he tries to convince Trunks that this is for fun and they shouldn't go all out. But in fact, Mr. Satan showing off backfires. Trunks falls a bit into the Goten vs. Ikose mindset. He hasn't entirely figured out that Mr. Satan is a fraud, but knows that what he's seen isn't terribly impressive. Since he thinks Mr. Satan is patronizing him, he gets really worked up. Quite frankly, I'm surprised Goku and the others aren't interested in seeing this. This should be incredibly entertaining for them. Finally, Mr. Satan devises a face-saving and really the obvious solution. He wasn't lying when he told Trunks this was just for fun. Nothing is at stake. This is an exhibition match, giving the best kid a chance to meet and show his skills against the world-famous Mr. Satan. No one's coming here to watch the world champion beat the snot out of a helpless eight-year-old. Losing is exactly what he needs to do. He simply needs to make it look like he's losing on purpose. So he convinces Trunks a light tap on the face is the customary pre-fight greeting. Unfortunately for him, he doesn't have to pretend to throw the fight, as Trunks' lightest punch is still enough to send him flying out of the ring and into the wall. Hey, you're lucky the ring has been redesigned. If this is the old layout, you'd still be in bounds. But Mr. Satan's unparalleled ability to spin ensures he holds on to his reputation. Luckily, he's able to hold on to his bladder control until he returns to his private room. This is why I overall love Trunks and Goten. Dragon Ball hasn't done anything quite like this before. Oh, it's had its share of kid characters, but never like these two. Gohan is even younger for a lot of his run, but he's a genius who grows up quickly in the traumatic world in which he finds himself. While Toriyama similarly gets a lot of comedic mileage out of adults underestimating Goku, Goku and Kuririn are introduced far older and are dedicated martial artists. They're also independent to an unrealistic degree. Goten and Trunks are kids through and through. They act just like real kids would act, with all the impulsiveness and immaturity that entails. The twist? They have godlike powers, and they act like kids who have godlike powers. Goku and Kuririn have a wise mentor telling them never to get too cocky because there's always someone stronger. These two don't have that. And their gifts are so effortless and so grand that any such assertion would feel hollow anyway. 
the Muten Roshi instructs his students to use their powers responsibly and ethically. Even then, we've seen some decisions that I would say don't fit that mold. Can you imagine a Goku without that restraint? Well, you don't have to. They're right here. Everything's a game to them. They get into mischief. But their play fights have the potential to reshape geography, and very little can stop them from acting out their fantasies. If Trunks wants to knock out a masked finalist and coerce Goten to join him in taking the man's place so they can fight with the adults, they have the power to make it happen. Power without responsibility or discipline. Just keep that tucked away. We'll see it crop up from time to time. Right now, it is absolutely hilarious. Meanwhile, Goku and the others are chowing down before the fighting begins. It's a nice callback to the fact that Goku loves to eat, especially prior to matches. But there are two things about it that bug me. Why is it Kuririn who's asking if Goku should be eating so much? He's already been through this, he should know better by now. And I really don't care for Gohan and Vegeta getting into the act. They've never been shown to have Goku's massive appetite, and it doesn't fit their characters nearly as well as it does Goku. I feel Vegeta has too much propriety to allow himself to be seen indulging like this. Gohan likewise has always been presented as exceptionally well-mannered and reluctant to draw attention to himself. As I've mentioned before, I don't care for Goku's personal traits being rewritten as Saiyan biology. It diminishes what makes the character unique. I'm not going to say it doesn't make logical sense, it does. A species that is so physically active and capable of such great power would most likely require large amounts of energy to sustain themselves. But I'd still rather do without it. After eating, the group encounter a rather interesting pair. They both wear ornate clothing, both have dangling earrings. The little one is floating. He does all the talking. He knows who Son Goku is and has been eager to meet him, to hopefully test him in a match. And as they leave, Goku comments that it might not be so easy for them to make a clean sweep of things as they thought. Toriyama sure loves his big guy little guy pairings, doesn't he? This is the first sign that there might be something serious about this tournament, as opposed to it simply running through all the permutations of the gag that the tournament is a commercialized sellout far beneath Goku and the gang. But consider that one of this pair is extraordinarily polite. He knows of Goku by reputation but has never met him. He wants to test Goku's strength. He's mysteriously powerful. No one's quite sure from the outset if he's friend or foe. It's going to turn out that he has information on an upcoming threat and has little patience for reckless behavior. We don't know who he is yet, but I know. He's Trunks. Yeah, as if another Trunks wasn't enough, we get another another Trunks. Trunks is popular, after all. I guess since the kid version of Trunks jettisoned a lot of future Trunks' mannerisms, behaviors, and story role, all of those attributes had to go somewhere. Maybe Toriyama was worried the new Trunks was too much of a departure and wanted to get that character type back into the story. Or maybe, as we'll see with other upcoming developments, Toriyama cannot think of any catalysts to get his stories going that exist outside of the familiar patterns. Either way, I'm sure this mysterious character is going to become important fairly soon. Thanks for watching. I hope you had a good time. If you did, check out all the other installments of Dragon Ball Dissection. Please support the channel however you can, be it through engaging with this video or by supporting on Patreon. And don't forget that I'm less than $100 a month away from reaching my goal of creating a bonus Dragon Ball Dissection video on the so-called OVA, Plan to Eradicate the Science, and its remake, Plan to Eradicate the Super Science. See you next time!